Welcome to Hello Self. It's a podcast focused on turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I am your host, coach, and author, Patricia Leonard. It's me again, your Hello Self podcast host, Patricia Leonard, and I'm so glad you're here because I have a fabulous guest today. And those of you who have tuned in to Hello Self in the past, you know that it's about turning your pants into cans and your dreams into plans. It's about time you get those dreams and goals off your someday show. And what I believe is that Hello Self interviews other individuals who have had Hello Self moments that have changed the trajectory of their life. And I also believe that in everyone's story, there are lots of gifts and many glories. And you're going to find that today in this guest that I have, Jordan O'Halloran. She is fabulous. She's the author of a book and much more, and she will be sharing her story today. So I'm going to ask her to just briefly introduce herself, say hello to all of you, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about her bio that she has shared with me, and after that, she'll tell you the real story, (laughs) and we'll have a conversation. So Pay attention to all the ideas that she gives you along the way. So, Jordan, could you just say hello to our audience? Yeah, definitely. Hi, everyone. Yeah, Yeah, just hi, everyone. And thank you for listening. And Patricia, thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it'll be the pleasure of anyone that is listening to this podcast now and in the future. So I'll shut up. That's hard for me to do. (laughs) I'll shut up for a moment and just um, share a brief bio of who Jordan is. She lives in beautiful California and is constantly intrigued by nature. When not daydreaming about the ocean or trees, you can find her writing, painting, or napping with her beloved cat. (laughs) I have a special friend that is going to love this because she's got a cat named Gravy and she adores that cat. So Jordan always had dreams of being a writer as a child, but inevitably chose careers of direct service. We don't always take the road directly to where we're going, But everything that we do on our journey adds value to where we end up living our dreams. Now, while finding her voice and purpose, she's made her way back to the written word. Isn't that fabulous? And we all get to be winners now. Jordan is the self-published writer of her first novel, Clean Up on Aisle 3 which is a young adult thriller that explores the inner world of the main character, Lucy McBride. Like Lucy, Jordan has had her share of mental health struggles, haven't we all? But don't let those define who she is, or but doesn't let those define who she is. She's going to be in, I read this book, and I'm telling you, I could not put it down. But I want her to share now her journey of how she got to writing, the the struggles that she may have had, and we'll also get to some of the celebrations that she's got going now. Jordan, could you just take it from here and just tell us what you want us to know about you on your journey? And when you had your hello self moment that you said, I am a writer and I'm going to write a book. Okay, thank you again for having me. For everyone listening, I'm Jordan, like Patricia said, just to go back what she was saying with me being a writer. So I will start from when I was a child, I was constantly reading. I went to the library every week, I always entered reading contests, like to track your reading and all of that. And so I as much as I read, I realized that I wanted to write as well. 
So I would write stories here and there as a kid, but I was always questioning my voice and stuff like that. So I put it on the back burner. And then when I went to college, I didn't take any writing classes or anything, but I did notice that my favorite assignments that I had were writing assignments. And so that kind of was a hello self moment. Hey, you like writing more than doing your other homework. <laughs> but I obviously had to get my degree. So I just put that on the back burner as well. Uh, but my final project for one of my classes is that I started a story. And that was really exciting and motivating for me. Uh, and I still have that story on my Google Drive, and I haven't really looked at it. I should probably look at it. But that was the momentum that kind of put something in my head. Hey, you should be writing. And so after that, I would buy notebooks and write journal entries or just stories that I would think of, but nothing really stuck. And then when I moved to where I live now, I live in a really rural, beautiful area of California. So there's not really a lot of distractions here, like movie times or the only big store we have is Walmart here. And I grew up in San Jose. So it's a very different environment than what I'm used to. But there's an art center here. And there was a writing class being offered. And I was like, I have the time. It's only a $5 class. Why not? So I went to this writing class and I started my clean up on aisle three book and just something inside of me started wanting to write Lucy's story. And I shared some of my story at that uh, event. I still have the notebook with my original <laughs> writing in it. And there was a lady in that class who said, hey, has anyone ever heard of the Santa Barbara Writers Conference? And for me, I was just writing again. So, of course, I've never heard of this conference. And that writers conferences are for real writers, right? That's yes. not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so she was like, if you can't afford it, there's scholarships. And I'm like, life is short. I'm just going to do it. So I ended up getting the scholarship, which was amazing because that paid for my week there. And then I met amazing writers and people that actually had books published. Like that was intimidating to me. And then the best thing ever happened to me is that I won best fiction of the whole conference. And this was in 2018. So that changed everything. After that, I was like, I need to get this book out there. I need to find an agent. I'm going to have a movie deal. Like all these things started yeah. playing in my head because uh, I was just so excited that my story had been perceived in a way that I wanted it to. But after looking for an agent and all of that, it didn't work out, which is totally fine. It actually worked out in a better way where I self-published. And so I was able to choose the cover. I didn't have to change any of my story so that was may, one of may the May I interrupt days. there? I think you yeah, of said something that is very, you've said several things and I've been jotting those down. But so much of the time, we think we're not good if we're turned down by an agent. And that has nothing to do with, I'm not saying at some point an agent might not really help propel or push our, our uh, career a little higher but I, I want you to, all of you that are listening, I want you to know that if you're turned down by an agent, keep going. And self-publishing has made many very famous writers. So great point. Okay, you know me, I'm always interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh -oh. so, okay, <laughs> I love your little tidbits. But yeah, <laughs> so after I won that, it really changed things for me. So... I was still at that time. I think at that time I was working with teen parents. Yes, I was working with teen parents at the time, which is why Lucy's voice, I think, can be so authentic uh, because I was with teens the whole time that I was writing that. Uh, but 
for people that are wanting to know about the mental health struggles and stuff in the book, uh, one of the main themes in it is that Lucy has bipolar disorder. Um, and I do as well. And I really wanted to shed light on that. Not to to say that my bipolar is like the biggest thing about me because it's definitely not but it definitely having that mental health issue or condition I don't know what the proper word is it's made me more tuned into myself as well as other people and mm. so I wanted to write a portrayal of it that's actually accurate because I think that bipolar is a dirty word for a lot yes. of people yes yeah that like they think that you're manic all the time and running around and or you're depressed and don't want to wake like you want to sleep all day which granted yes I've had moments of both of those but I'm okay and I'm here yes and that, that is the key there's nothing and you did not let that define you. That's what I really like. Mm -hmm. You did. And we can let those things, those issues of our society or those, the way people put people in a box about certain issues, mental health and all that. And you didn't let it define you. And what she's saying, don't let it define you. Let Listen to the rest of her story and you'll see that instead of making her put it, get in a box, it has now created much better understanding of self-awareness. Yes. Okay. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm just trying to think what else I can talk about. Yeah. So you can say, if you want to say more about the book, anything in it, because what was clean up on aisle three really about and how did that uh, was it relationships in the family? Was it because I think a lot of people struggle with that family mm -hmm. issue that they think yeah. defines them and what they're finding out when they start writing. I think I was and, and this is something that I really like about what you're saying is. I asked a young man one time, friend of mine, where do you get he's a songwriter and I said, where do you get your songs? And he said, first of all, it's my experiences. And I think that we think we're writing songs for somebody else or we're writing books for somebody else. And it's really raising the awarenesses of who we are a lot of times because I've had that same experience, mm -hmm. yeah. And it freed you up. Yeah. You said it gave me freedom, yeah. So anything you mm -hmm. want to say about Lucy, too would be okay. Yeah. The thing all that stands out to me the, the most is that writing this was a very healing process for me because there was a lot of stuff that was living in my head that I wasn't able to get past. Mm -hmm. That there's a lot of stuff that has happened to me that I was constantly people pleasing, putting myself second, uh I, when people would treat me bad, I thought it was something that was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of this, I wouldn't say trauma. Yes. Like a lot of the trauma that I have gone through internalized in me and made me someone that I was starting not to recognize. So I writing this is me taking my power back in mm -hmm. a way that I can rewrite someone else's story based on some things that have happened to me and to have her prevail like I have. And so this writing this was really, really difficult because it brought up things that I forgot about or I wouldn't say forgot, probably just pushed to the side because it was uncomfortable. Yeah. We stuff and it, so, don't we? We stuff it. That, and then it comes out in really weird ways. And I think that writing this made me be at peace with things. Mm -hmm. That I don't live there anymore. I'm not a child yes. anymore. So I moved <laughs> <it's>, out. <laughs> exactly. I love that. 
Yeah, so I think analogy. I'm... I lived in that house long enough, and Lucy moved, and I moved out. <laughs> right. A great the house is sold now. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> A great analogy. Oh my gosh, that's fabulous! I loved another thing that you said. You got in this group of other writers that were well known. I think that's something that a lot of people feel intimidated by sometimes. And they don't, like you said, I had a hello self moment. I said, I'm going to go for this. What the heck? And getting around other people and you can see and hear. So I think that's another thing. How did that impact you getting around other writers that had already maybe made some success? Yeah. Yeah. That was extremely intimidating at mm. first, mm. especially because if the people that are listening look up the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, Patricia, they have New York Best Time seller writers there that speak. Like every night they have uh, a speaker come in that's a famous writer. And I just remember being in the audience and I'm like, this could be me. Like, how cool that there's like people sitting here for an hour and listening to every word that this person is saying. But with that, like life, there was a duality. Because in my mind, I'm like, no one's ever going to want to listen to what I have to say. Mm -hmm. I'm just that boring girl from San Jose with two brothers and a family. No one is going to care. But I'm learning now that my story does matter. And there's things that I wrote about in this book that I've had people tell me, did you write about my life? And I'm like, no, I wrote about my life. And so there's this thing in writing. I don't know if you know about it, Patricia, or anyone out there that it's called the great paradox that the more specific we are with our writing, the more people can relate to it. And that still blows my mind because in my, when I first started writing this, I just made generalizations like Lucy was depressed, but then I was like, no, I need to write in more detail than that. Mm -hmm. And I've learned by adding those details and snippets of stuff that's happened to me, people can see themselves more in it. And that has been so profound. Jordan, when I was, uh, I, I can relate to what you're saying. I didn't know that uh, particular phrase, but I can relate to what you're saying because I am not a, a reader. This is how I read chapter one. And then I skip to the middle chapter and then I skip to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told you this as I was going through it because she put a requirement on me that I had to read this book <laughs> and she yes. sent the book to me so I committed to her that I would and I did and I'm telling you I could I love Lucy <laughs> that's a was a show years ago but I could relate to you Lucy it wasn't my story but I could relate to some of the issues from a family mm -hmm. standpoint and from my own self-image, which some people wouldn't believe that about me because I'm so outgoing that I was insecure at one point and I still find myself being insecure and I don't care. Mm -hmm. Even famous writers, I know they must have some moments of insecurity about something. But so I think that, and, and I like what you did, you recognized it. And you went ahead and pushed through. And that's the only way to the audience, jo uh, Jordan just told you, the only way you can do that, or maybe not the only way, but you can do that by simply stepping up and saying, hello, self, what are we going to do here? And actually talking to yourself and mm -hmm. saying, I am this, but I don't have to stay in this. I'm going to sell the house, she said. <laughs> I love that analogy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, sell the house and get out of that house you put yourself in, that dark room or whatever. But I'm telling you, I was so fascinated by Lucy's journey. And it wasn't all my story, but 
uh, pieces of it were just uh, that I had insecurities at times in my life. I still do. What, is that? what can I say? But I think it's just like you said some things and I thought I had it all figured out. You know how you start re reading a book and I say, oh, I know how this is going to end. I watch the life channel all the time and I know exactly how those things are going to end. And so I said, I know who's going to be guilty in the end of the book. Oh boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so I love that the way you twist it, not twist it. I don't know what the words are, but the way you created the story mm -hmm. was suspenseful, emotional relationships. I love being and and all about our own image of ourselves. It was so many things in one book that you could you will not be able to lay it down. Go get it wherever it is. <laughs> She's going to tell you yeah, that. I was just going to say that it's on Amazon and all like major booksellers. And Patricia, if you have people that like want me to mail them a signed copy, I can do that as well. Yes. So. I just want people to read it. And we will we will have that on this podcast, how you relate or how you reach out to myself or Jordan and preferably Jordan, because uh, you're, you're going to build a relationship directly with the author. And what was your career before you became an author? I wanted because we didn't really highlight a lot on that. And how is that opening doors? your prior career? Because I say, people say, oh, I shouldn't have wasted my years on that. No, nothing is wasted. So how did mm -hmm. that, Im yeah, and I see you're nodding, yes. Yeah, no, so you definitely bring up a good point because I, up until total transparency, up until two weeks ago, I thought that I was wasting my time with other careers. But I'm learning now that I met some of the best people of my life at those jobs. And I've made amazing friends because of those jobs. But I went to college to be a teacher. I wanted to be a special education teacher since I was like eight years old. I love children. And I especially love children that have different needs than other children. And so I really wanted to be around that environment. So I graduated college with a degree in liberal studies, which is the pathway to become a teacher. And I told myself before I strap in and get my teaching credential, why don't I work in classrooms? So I was a classroom aide for four years, maybe a little bit longer than that. And I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And so I went to grad school. I moved to San Francisco, of all places, because they have a program there where you can get your master's and credential at the same time. I was like, this is perfect. And then I woke up one morning and I was like, this is not exciting for me anymore. This, maybe it was the school I was at. Maybe it was just the overwhelming idea of being a teacher because as a special ed teacher, you're not just a teacher, you're a caregiver, you're an advocate, you do data entry, there's so many things. And so I was like, I'm not excited about this. So I dropped out, which was a horrible idea because school is very expensive. And with living in San Francisco and getting your credential and master's, it's about $900 a unit. So I have a lot of student debt now, but that's okay. And then I was like, okay, I still like kids and they have disabilities. So I started being like a behaviorist. I don't know if you know what that is, but a what? it's for kids. A behaviorist. Have you heard of it? Yes, but I don't tell so, me. I want to hear your definition. Yeah. So it's like kids that have severe behavior challenges. Mm -hmm. You go into their home and you help them redirect and find more positive ways of dealing with that. And so I did that and I had TVs thrown at me and scratches and all that. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore either. 
<laughs> so I was in just this like really weird spot. And like I said, in the county I live in, it's really rural and there's limited resources. And so I was like, what can I do? I don't want to work fast food. I don't want to work at Walmart because those jobs are super stressful. I didn't want to do that. I found a nonprofit where I live and they were hiring for a teen parenting advocate, which means you meet girls or guys that have had a baby Like my youngest client was 14 and she had a daughter. And so I got that job and I did that for two and a half years. And let me say, Patricia, that was one of the best jobs I've ever had. I don't have children myself. I don't want children. But the strength and resilience of those girls still baffles me to this day that they had a baby so young and just made it work. And so I love that job. But then once I quit that job, I'm always like, I don't like to say stagnant. So (laughs) I was like, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? And so then I became a case manager for homeless people here. We'd help them get housing and stuff. So I did that. And then COVID hit. And then I was a housing navigator, which means I worked with property managers to get them to rent to these homeless people. And that was super rewarding. I think I housed 13 people. Wow. And that was amazing being able to say, here's a key to your house. Oh, wow. It still feels thinking about that. Yeah. So I did that. And then I did. I was really burnt out on helping people. So I took the back seat and did more data entry, like behind the scenes stuff for a homeless shelter. <laughs> and then I stopped doing that. And then I was a substitute teacher this last school year for a third grade classroom. And then here I am now. So I've had many different roles of helping people because. I always want to do that. Yeah. One, oh my gosh, you are just amazing. I love every time you have a hello self moment. First of all, you pay attention to Jordan, to her feelings. And honey, most people in this world, I probably shouldn't have said honey, but anyway, I did. <laughs> most people in this world don't, they won't take the effort, even though they're miserable. They're just going through the motions of life instead of stepping out and saying, I've done everything I want to do there and it's not exciting for me anymore. I want to do this and step up and do something. You pay attention to the nudges. And this is a great lesson for everybody out there. What are the nudges that spirit or yourself is giving you about your life? And maybe to really have life and living, it's time to take action on those nudges because they're just not by accident. They're to help you live a better life. And look where Jordan is now. She pays attention to those nudges and she's got more to share. You just shared something else, Jordan, before we got on the podcast about doing a workshop with some women. Could you also share that? Because this is another aspect of her work that has, and and so it's not leaving what she did. She's gathering data. Everything, every job you have is gathering more data and more information. Number one, about what the capabilities or the skills that are needed as well and this is what I love about what Jordan's been saying, as well as who I am. I pay attention to who I am. And could you share about the workshop that you've been doing with some younger people? And the oh, young- yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, I will just give a little bit of background. So- yeah, yeah, thank you. So when I started writing this book and when I finally did write it, I had people ask, me, hey, Jordan, will you teach me how to write? And I was like, that's a really intimidating question because <laughs> I don't know fully what I'm doing, but 
and I've never taken a formal writing class. In my mind, I'm like, I'm not the right person to do this. <laughs> I definitely not the right exactly. person. Um, <laughs> so I was like, you know what, whatever, I'm just going to do it. Living in this small county with all the trauma that people have in general, I'm just going to go for it. So I started teaching at a local art gallery about three and a half years ago. And I was teaching every weekend, every Saturday. And I was like, I'm getting burned out on this. I can't do this every weekend. And so I pulled back and I got a grant from the local behavior health here to teach my classes. And so I started doing that and I made connections that way. And my classes were open to any age. And I realized that I mostly had people that were retired and that had a lot of life in them that they could write about. And that was totally fine. But I was like, my main audience that I want to write to are youth and kids that are starting to develop themselves. Um, Because my book is a young adult novel. So it made sense for me to do that. And so I was asked if I would teach my writing classes as like a summer camp kind of class. Uh, And this was two summers ago. Time is so weird. I I know. (laughs) I'm like, I'm I'm always going to see it. I'm like, (laughs) when was that? But (laughs) anyway, I think it was two summers ago. And so I started teaching this youth camp and I loved it because I gave them journals and all this stuff. And I have pictures on my phone still of them writing and it always makes me excited. So this week, starting on Monday, I was teaching another one. And so the story that Patricia is wanting me to tell actually happened yesterday. And I still am emotional about it, but I'll get to it. So down the street from my house is a coffee shop. And I always want people to read my book whenever they can, however they can. So the coffee shop by my house has a little free library. And so during Christmas last year, I put three books down there because I was like, it's the holidays. People are probably, the holidays are tough for me anyway. So I was like, I'm sure that the holidays are going to be tough for some people. So I'm just going to put my book down there. So yesterday I'm talking to one of the kids in my class, like just getting to know them. And where I live, it's called the Riviera like the French Riviera of all things. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> I know, it's very fancy. Yeah, but, yeah, great. Um, I live in the Riviera, but no. <laughs> I'm so I'm excited so to be talking to someone from the Riviera. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but oh this God. little girl was like, yeah, I live in the Riviera. And I was like, oh, so do I. And we're just talking and I don't really have kids call me by my last name if I'm teaching. Like when I taught third grade, I was Mrs. O. But when I'm teaching this camp, they can call me Jordan. That's totally fine because I think it helps break down the walls anyway. Right. So we're sitting there and she was like, have you written any books before? And I was like, yeah, I wrote a book and all this stuff. And she's a little young, so I don't really want to say like it's about a murder or anything. No, yeah people off and she was like wait does your book have a dead body on it and I was like an outline of one yeah and she's does it have apples on it and I'll show on the camera there's apples and there's a little higher a little higher yeah there you go better yeah Yeah, because you can see the outline you can see the apples and so she was like wait your name's Jordan right and I was like Yep. And she's like, I read your book. And I was like, you did? And she's like, yes, I got it at the coffee shop by my house during Christmas time. And I'm like, I put those books there. And her eyes, Patricia, were just like, I know the author of that book. And I was like, yeah, that's me. And the joy in her eyes knowing that she had met the author is something that I'm going to take with me forever. It was, it's why I wrote this book Mm -hmm. Um, and wanting to write and 
the amount that I read growing up, it just was a really inspiring moment for me to keep going. Mm -hmm. Because like I was saying, I don't like being stagnant. So I get frustrated when I'm not where I want to be. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm only 34. But there's so many expectations that I have for myself mm -hmm. that aren't always realistic. <laughs> but just how do you know? That... How do you know? <laughs> true <laughs> but just hearing that yesterday was just I couldn't talk when I was driving home because I'm just still you can see by my face I just honored mm. and amazed and what it reminds me of is I think it was 2018 you said you went and saw all those writers and mm -hmm. they were all famous and all that. That's how she felt about you. Oh, my gosh. I really met a real writer. So mm -hmm. I think it's always in the eyes of the beholder who we are to them. And so I love that. And the things that you're doing to help others, number one, to help yourself, because this is what you uh, dreamed of since you were a little girl. And mm -hmm. now, sometimes we it takes longer than we think it does, or we think I'm just wasting my time along the way. But remember, you're creating your every place that we are. I always say this. I do a lot of coaching. And one of the things I always tell people is you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Now, I didn't think that when I was moving forward. And I still have those days that, oh, my gosh, is this ever going to end? But we are exactly where we're supposed to be in any point in life. And we need to pay attention. What's going on here? Instead of just writing it off, that was a lost time or whatever, because everything adds value to who we are and to others. And I love that. Yeah. I really, I, yeah. Yeah. There was like a few months ago that I had called my friend Gloria and I was like, Gloria, I am so frustrated of this uphill battle. I just want to be here. I want to be in this spot. And she's Jordan, you're going to miss these moments. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm not going to miss be having this uphill battle and being frustrated. And she's like, you are though, because this is where the growth is happening. And you're going to be able to look back and say that you were there. And I'm like, why do you have to be right? Because <laughs> it's true. Because now with these hello self moments, like of that stuff that happened yesterday, amazing, right? For one, but I don't have to grow from that. I don't have to reevaluate what I'm doing because my brain is telling me, Jordan, you won. You're good. And so she was right. I, I'm having these moments now and I'm so grateful, but I don't know how to say this. Like I'm leveling out and what I wanted for so long is continuing to come true. That it's weird not having hurdles yes. as much. Like obviously there's still going to be some life is never perfect, but it's just so strange that I don't have to fight uphill as much anymore and, and, um, yeah and you said something life is never perfect the truth is it is perfect and yet our image of what it should be says no that's not perfect yeah so I think that's not what I wanted it to be we stay on the road to the continual discovery and I love what you just said a while ago too you're learning how to celebrate Instead, even the moments like your friend reminded you, even the moments that's not fitting your perfect <laughs> image of where you should be, uh, there's still celebratory kind of points that you are starting to appreciate because you know it's taking you to, it's waking you up more and more each day. Yeah. So, did you have something else I was going to ask you? What is ahead for you, Jordan? Well, I think even if it's gonna... only your dreams. <laughs> yeah, no, I have a lot of dreams. I am editing my second book. 
um, my goal is to have it out by Christmas. And it's a totally different story than Lucy's story. I'll come back and we'll talk about that one. Yes. <laughs> but that's my main goal at this moment and is that I want my goal is moving forward. Every book that I write, I want it to come out during the holidays because I am selfish and I want people to give them out as gifts. Yes. That's always going to be my goal because we have so much time off during Christmas or I shouldn't say Christmas, all holidays in December. We have lots of time to unwind and reflect. And so I want my book to be something. And it's an opportunity for gift giving that adds value to somebody's life and exactly. not just another knickknack to put on the shelf or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah, so I think, and she's the, we're talking about her coming to Nashville and maybe setting up some speaking engagements to groups and getting involved in writers, maybe women in film and television, speaking at a luncheon engagement. But it doesn't matter right now what it is, wherever she is, she's look, and I want to talk to some people while she's here about movie, taking this to a faith and film kind of movie producer. And talking a little bit more about that, because I think it would be perfect for um, a production of faith and film. And I think more and more, as our society is shifting, faith and film movies are becoming very, they're attended very well. And they tell stories, they're just, uh, and they change people's lives. So I think this would be another thing that we will be talking more about even maybe before she gets her other book done, just doing a short podcast that she's coming to town. Yes. Anything else you want to say in closing or any advice you want to give the people? Again, do you have an email or do you just say, go get my book on, it's out, on all these outlets? Yeah, people can email me. My email is just Jordan, oh19 at gmail.com. I also have social media and my, I think they call it a handle on social media is just Jordan writes down J O T S joy, J O Y. So and I'm on. Yeah. Go ahead. No. What were you going to say? I was just going to say that I'm on Facebook with that and Instagram. I've taken a break from social media for the last month or so but I'm probably going to start going on and posting again in a few days because I want to stay relevant. But oh. for my mental health, I needed to take a break from social media. So uh, that's another thing to remember when we've stressed ourselves, boy, this week, I'm telling you, <laughs> I have been so stressed. I said, oh, please help me get through this day. But interested in Jordan speaking to your group, then email her or get in touch with her on social media. And we will have that on this podcast available to you, the links and stuff. And she could maybe speak virtually or you guys could figure it out, but she could talk to some young artists that might be interested in writing books or mm -hmm. uh, just helping them find their niche and uh, believe in themselves. Those, is there anything else that we need to say? Just remember all of these things that Jordan has said. She's just like yeah. anybody else. Yeah, the only thing that I'll end our conversation with is to do things afraid. Don't, I am constantly anxious. Like even before our conversation today, Patricia, I was nervous and I'm like, I'm a fraud, but I'm learning more and more. Just show up afraid. Just do it. You're going to, I'm learning now that I regret not doing things. I'd rather have the experience and say, yes, I did it and I failed than have my brain awake at 3 a.m. telling me, Jordan, why didn't you do that? Mm -hmm. So my advice to everyone is do things afraid. Even if your voice shakes, and your hand, like my hands are shaking right now, do it anyway, because you're going to think more about not doing it than doing it. 
So great message. If you think that what she said doesn't impact me, what about when your computer's going down and it's a brand new computer and you don't even know anything about that computer and it says you're running out of battery (laughs) and you have to jump up in the middle and plug it in again. But you know what? We went on. And that's the whole thing is to not let these things that get in the way of us sometimes get in the way of us. So, Jordan, thank you, thank you, thank you. And audience, you will hear more from Jordan. We'll do other kind of things along the way and keep you informed through podcast and let you know what's going on and other ideas that she has that could help people. Maybe we'll even do a virtual workshop on um, Hello Self. And we'll just see how all this goes, but we're just in the exploring stages right now. And she's got a lot of things going herself. In closing, thank you for all your ideas and thank you for being brave enough to create this book and then being brave enough to come on here and tell us about your journey because I think you talk to a lot of us in the audience. I know you talk to me. So in closing today, thank you everyone for being part of tuning in to Hello Self Podcast. And again, I am your host, Patricia Leonard. If you want to be on a podcast, just go to my website, patricialeonard.net, and let me know, and we'll talk more about it. Or if you're interested in coaching, just leave a message or send, check in my uh, website and let me know. Thank you very much. And as always say before we hang up, keep dreaming. Thank you for joining Hello Self today. And may it offer insight and inspire you to stay on your runway to success. Like, share, and subscribe. And remember this, keep dreaming. Keep dreaming.